The holidays are usually a time where families come together to celebrate and enjoy the season. At times, with so many different characters and ideas in one place mingling together, arguments may arise and differences of opinion may get the best of us. But those moments pass. They are temporary because we understand the family is more than a heated moment or wanting to be right about something. It's about having people who you grew up with, who you know and trust, your tribe so to speak. And knowing that no matter what, they have your back just like you've got theirs. Yet, what happens when you can't trust them? When those you love and who you expect to have your back and protect you are the ones that actually bully, beat, and torture you. What if it was your own sister who encouraged your executioner and egged him on to commit these crimes, not only with you, but with your other siblings as well? This video comes with a trigger warning due to torture and violence. There will also be pictures of the crime scene and weapons used that include blood in the images. If you're triggered by one of these, then this isn't the video for you. Also, be aware the story I'm about to tell you today is pretty rough. Like, really rough. So, if you are a little bit on the weaker side and don't like listening to things that are a little gruesome yeah don't don't watch <laughs> otherwise let's get on with our gruesome tale and oh um happy holidays so are you ready then take my hand hold it tight and let's walk into the darkness together on february 21st 1983 jacqueline and pierre bamu had their first child a little baby girl which they named Magali. At the time, the small family was living in the Democratic of Congo. Now, for some unknown reason, she was raised by her aunt and uncle instead of her parents until she was five. But shortly after Magali turned five, they moved to Paris, France, where Pierre opened the carpentry business, where he would design and manufacture furniture. Now, it's not known why, but after Magali turned 13, Jacqueline and Pierre left her in Dagenham, East London, with Jacqueline's niece, which is either named Phoebe or Bibi, and her husband, Fernandin, while they moved back to the Democratic of Congo for a time. Unfortunately, the time that Magali spent with them wasn't a pleasant one, since Phoebe, or Bibi, and her husband tended to treat her like a slave more than family, and forced her to cook, clean, and look after and care for their children. They didn't even allow her to go to school. As she got older, Magali enrolled in classes at a nearby college and worked as a maid and paid for them as well as bus fare and any supplies she may need. As she progressed with her schooling, she was able to find work as a receptionist first and then even as a dental nurse later on. She was introduced to a young man named Eric Bikrubi by a friend. Eric was a football coach and they hit it off immediately. Magali liked that he was really nice and protective and soon they had become an item. As the relationship progressed, Eric became to change, however, becoming much more controlling than protective. He forbade her the use of makeup and wouldn't allow her to go out or even have friends. He also became very verbally abusive towards her. Now, I'm also going to give you a quick recap of Eric's background, since it'll be important to tie things together and that they make sense. So. Eric was also born in the Democratic of Congo in the year 1983. His mother passed away during childbirth and he was raised by his father who was extremely superstitious, especially about a particular branch of Congo witchcraft called Kindoki, where children are possessed by evil spirits and must be exorcised. His father, of course, taught him all about it, including how to recognize it and how to exorcise it which I'll also give you a brief explanation of. So usually a community elder will point out a child who has been possessed because they see specific traits in the child that they associate with Kindoki. However, these traits aren't what we are used to hearing about with possessions, but more normal common traits the children might possess, 
such as wetting the bed or biting their nails, maybe stealing something. Now, once you are pointed out, you'll have to go through a process to be exercised, which includes continuous prayer for days, being deprived of food and water throughout the length of the ritual, beatings, and even mutilation at times. The belief is that the spirit has taken over the child's body, so it's the spirit who is being put through this torture, and not the child, whose own spirit is lying unconscious somewhere in the body, and can't feel any of it. So in 1990, at the age of seven, Eric left the Democratic of Congo with his uncle in hopes of escaping the war that had broken out there. They settled in London, and his uncle actually continued Eric's Kintoki lessons until he passed away. Now, Magali stated that through their relationship, Eric became more and more obsessed with Kintoki. It was all he spoke about, and she claimed that he'd go on for long rants about it that lasted hours. She said that she'd learned to just stay quiet and let him talk until he had gotten it all out of his system. And then he'd just stop and go quiet. Magali also claimed that his obsession was so strong that he began to dream that his own brother had killed him. To rid himself of the evil spirits that were obviously causing this, Eric began to move around into different apartments throughout London. When that didn't work and the dreams persisted, he sought the help of Nigerian pastors who knew about Kindogi and could help him. At least he thought they could. At one point, a young woman named Naomi Ilanga and her boyfriend went to stay with Eric and Magali. Naomi had the unfortunate habit of biting her nails, however, and as soon as Eric saw this, he understood beyond a doubt that Naomi had kindoki and needed to be exercised. So for three long days, Eric refused to give Naomi food or water. He refused her sleep as well, opting instead for sitting with her and Magali and praying non-stop. Her beautiful long hair was cut very short, which would apparently release the spirit that was in her. This ordeal ended when Naomi managed to call her mother and ask for help. Her mother did show up shortly after and rescued her. Now Eric turned on Magali for this, deciding that she had let Naomi go and she shouldn't have. So as punishment, Eric gave Magali a black eye and forced her to eat off of the floor. After this incident, Magali left Eric, choosing to stay at a woman's refuge rather than to take the abuse. Three months after, however, Eric apologized and asked her to marry him. And as crazy as it sounds, Magali accepted and just like that, the couple was engaged and back to living together again. Now, I'm not sure if her family knew about the previous abuse or about Naomi for that matter, but it seems that they were very happy with the news of her being engaged. In fact, by now the family had grown a lot and her parents had moved back to Paris and they decided that her five siblings were going to head to London and spend the holidays with her and Eric. Her siblings were really excited and couldn't wait to see their big sister and celebrate the engagement and the holidays with her and her fiancé. So, just to give you an idea, the five siblings consisted of two girls and three boys. A 22-year-old young man who was autistic, a 15-year-old named Christy whom the next part of the story will mostly revolve around, and a 13-year-old who, for legal reasons, wasn't named. Now, the girls consisted of a 20-year-old woman named Kelly and an 11-year-old girl who, of course, wasn't named either. And in case you were wondering, at this point, Magali herself was 29, while Eric is a year younger than she is and was 28. So, the siblings arrive at the big sister's house in London, and everything is going wonderful. They're spending time together and catching up. They're getting to know Eric better, and overall, it's just having a great time all together. After some time, however, Eric became convinced that Christy had tried to put spells on one of the younger siblings, and that they all had Kindoki and had come to London to kill him. 
Magali, of course, knew what was going on, but her brothers and sisters had been born and raised in Paris and had no idea of the superstitious beliefs of the Democratic of Congo. And when the commotion and accusations happened, they became extremely confused and frightened. They denied the accusations, pleading with Eric and their sister, who to their horror had joined in and began to question and accuse them as well. Magali's siblings, like Naomi before, were denied water, food, and sleep. They were forced to pray continuously and were beaten without remorse. The abuse got to the degree where Eric even tried to force them out of the 8th floor window of the apartment to see if they could fly. Through all of this, Magali not only participated, but she also encouraged and egged Eric on. No matter how much they begged their sister and Eric, it wouldn't stop. Kelly and her smaller sister finally confessed to being witches and using witchcraft simply to have the torture end. Unfortunately for Christy, that very night when it was his turn to receive the beatings, he received an exceptionally rough one, which caused him to wet himself. When Eric saw this, he understood it as a sign that Christy was the one who had brought the Kindoki with him to London. Because of this, they now began to focus all of their efforts on Christy. The beatings tripled in brutality, with them now pushing the other siblings to join in. Magali and Eric forced them to restrain him while they smashed an iron rod against his mouth, knocking two teeth out. They smashed bottles on his head, ceramic tiles on his back. Magali smashed his hands with a hammer, and they used a knife to make cuts all over his body. They used the hammer with a chisel and even took a pair of pliers and twisted his ear until they ripped a piece off. Through all of this, Christy kept begging them to stop, but it was no use. After around three and a half days of torture, Christy finally saw an opportunity and confessed to being a witch, practicing witchcraft and being the one who brought in the kindoki. Basically, just agreeing and saying whatever it took to end the suffering. Eric then ordered the other siblings to clean up the apartment and the blood and played loud music while screaming at them to do things. The neighbors called the cops and complained about the noise, but for some reason the complaint wasn't followed up on. Eventually, Eric placed a call to Pierre and Jacqueline and made it very clear that if they did not come and get Christy, he would kill him. Eric had phoned them multiple times throughout this so-called exorcism to tell them that their children were possessed and had brought Kendoki into his house, but they hadn't really taken him seriously until now. After hearing Eric's plan to kill Christy, however, they realized how serious the situation really was and began to look for a rental car to make the six-hour trip to their children. Now remember, this was Christmas Day and a lot of things are closed so it probably took them a bit to find one. But while this was happening and they were starting their trip to London, Eric and Magali forced all of their siblings into a bathtub and began a cleansing ritual where Eric began to hose all of them down with ice cold water. Unfortunately, the extreme brutality inflicted on Christy, along with the sleep, food, and water deprivation had caused the boy too much physical and mental anguish and exhaustion. The last words that Christie's brothers and sisters heard him utter was one last weak plea to just let him die before his head dipped down into the water that had accumulated in the tub. Eric continued the assault until he realized that Christie wasn't moving anymore. He then stopped and pulled him out of the water. They called the paramedics who loaded Christie into the ambulance, but it had been too late. Christie's body had given up on him. He was pronounced dead on his way to the hospital due to a combination of being beaten and drowning. At around 8 p.m., as he was frantically driving to London to get to his son, Pierre received a call from Kelly informing him that Christy was dead. Now, when the cops arrived at the apartment, they found a crime scene and weapons that you've been seeing in the photos, along with Christy's brothers and sisters standing in the living room, bruised, crying hysterically and soaking wet. They immediately arrested Eric and Magali. It was later known that Christie suffered 130 injuries during the so-called exorcism. 
Eric and Magali were both charged with murder and two counts of actual bodily harm. Eric pled guilty but claimed that due to a combination of schizophrenia, cultural upbringing, and brain damage that he had suffered, he truly believed that Christie was a witch and should have diminished responsibility. Magali claimed that she had been manipulated by Eric into doing these things and that she truly didn't believe in witchcraft. The judge said that the belief in witchcraft, however genuine, cannot excuse an assault to another person, let alone the killing of another human being. He also told Magali that he didn't accept her denial of belief in witchcraft and her claims that she was forced to attack Christie. He said, it's only explicable if you shared Eric Bikubi's beliefs. It produces some explanation for what happened, but it does not excuse it. He added that at no stage during the trial has she said sorry, highlighting the lack of guilt that she felt. The judge told the court that he would place sentence based on the majority of the jury's verdict. Kelly broke down several times during the eight week long trial. She said, Christy asked for forgiveness. He asked again and again. She called Magali an idiot and said, I'm sure she still believes even to this day that we are witches. I have no pity for her. She had no pity for us. The jury also had a chance to hear a statement from Pierre, which made them break down in the court. He said, Christy died of unimaginable circumstances at the hands of people he loved and trusted. People we all loved and trusted. I feel betrayed. To know that Christie's own sister, Magali, did nothing to save him makes the pain that much worse. We are still unaware of the full extent of the brutality. We cannot bring ourselves to hear it. He said that he must forgive his son's killer for the sake of the family, stating that we will never forget, but to put our lives back into sync, we must forgive. Eric Bikubi was sentenced to a minimum of 30 years in prison, and Magali Bamu was sentenced to a minimum of 25, which considering that she not only didn't have the mental conditions that Eric had, but was Christie's actual sister, to me it was too weak of a sentence. That's it for today. Let me know what you thought of today's story. Did you think it was just disturbed or are you like me and felt that the punishment didn't really fit the crime? And if you found me through a bill, let me know where you're from in the comments below. Now don't forget that you can help my small channel grow by sharing it with others who love scary stories just like us. Also, remember as always to like if you liked and subscribe if you want more. See you next time.